Well, we originally asked this speaker if we could have his talk. We wanted to put it in the morning. And he said, no, 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 no. Put it at the end of the day. For in the mornings, I hunt. <laughs> what does he hunt for, you ask? Oh, different things, trifles, really. A vine found in the deepest of jungles that makes the sound of a woman sobbing when it blooms. A mirror that shows the reflection of everyone born in a small town in Turkey. And rings that allow you to fly, but only for short distances and only on Thursdays. Some of these objects are dangerous, some not, but all hold his attention and curiosity. And when he gets back from a hunt, he carefully catalogs them with small handwritten notes and adds them to his vast collection in his vast underground vault. And when he's done with this talk and dawn hits, he will hunt again. And maybe this time he'll be hunting for you. <laughs> he is Terry Ryan. I've had a lot of talks uh, with a lot of you here. And as much as I've enjoyed that, that right there was the highlight of <laughs> my time at DevOps. Um, so my talk is driving technical change. Um, it's kind of cool. There goes last, right? Because you've learned all this stuff. Now, how do you bring it back to um, the people you work with? So does this sound familiar, right? You, you got excited about new technology, new tools here. How many people learned something here that they want to bring back to their workplace? All right, good. That's a good event. All right, so you get excited, right? And now you're working hard to figure out where you can use it, where it makes sense in your organization to use this, right? Because we don't want to just use technology because it's shiny. I mean, we do, but we need to justify it, right? So you work hard to figure out where this makes sense. And then you share it with you know, coworkers and stakeholders, and you get maybe less than a, less than a you know, full-throated support. Um, and then you find yourself here. Dreams crushed. Uh, you'll not, you'll, you won't move on. You won't, you won't get to put this new thing into, into action, into production. So how many people have experienced this? OK, good. And I want to make sure you know that, right? There are other people in the room. You're not alone. Everybody in this room has probably run into it, even the people that like their arms are paralyzed and they can't raise their hands. Um, you're not alone. And when you get, when you have this happen, a lot of times you go seeking out advice, and the advice that I always heard that drove me to come up with this talk was this, change your organization or change your organization. And I never really liked that advice. Yesterday, a speaker used it at the end, uh, Ken, used it at the end, and he was talking about changing your organization if your organization is toxic, right? And I was like, that's awesome. I've never heard it used properly like that. That's when you do change your organization or change your organization. But when you talk about these things where people aren't going to adopt new tools or technology, this makes an assumption that you can leave your job, go to another place, and not run into these. That there are these companies where you go to drive new technical things, and people just go, yep, let's go. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very honest. I'm going to talk about my, a little bit of my background here to explain this idea that I, this isn't a real choice. You only have one choice, change your organization. Because even if you do go somewhere else, it's going to be exactly the same. And I don't mean that in a pessimistic way. It's just that's the way the world is. So I currently work for Google. Before I worked for Google, I worked for Adobe. And before I worked for Adobe, I worked for a little place called the Wharton School of Business. Has anybody here heard of the Wharton School of Business? OK. Uh, I apologize if you've heard about it recently. Um, so the Wharton School of Business is inarguably one of the top 10 business schools in the world. It is arguably the number one business school in the world. Usually, that's an argument you have with someone who goes to the Wharton School of Business. Um, but it is a top, it's a world-class organization. And it found in the early 90s that it was competing with Harvard and Stanford. They're like, those were, those, those were the people they wanted, those are the schools that they wanted to be better than. And it's kind of tough. Harvard is Harvard. In addition to it having name recognition, like you know, in, in academia, that you just can't get anywhere else. Um, it is also uh, has a gigantic endowment, right? So like just if you want to try to do something, you want to try to have a program, Harvard has the money to do it. Likewise, Stanford, uh, also good name recognition, but was very close to the, in, in addition to being like uh, in like virtual paradise on the, on the West Coast, it, uh, it also had a very tight pipeline in the Silicon Valley. And Wharton is in Philadelphia. And for those of you that have been to Philadelphia, you can say you've been to Philadelphia, right? <laughs> I love it. It's home 
or was home uh, for a very long period of time, but I have a, you know, a, a lifelong residence love of it, not, you know, a, a, not an outsider's view of it. So what they decided to do is they tried to, decided to make technology key to everything they did. They wanted to wrap it up into every single part of the Wharton experience. And so starting in the early 90s, they did this work. They had a portal before Yahoo existed. They had a Facebook before Facebook. They had the classroom that like had all of the, you know, you press a button and the shades come down and projects and everything's on computers. They had that before, like five to 10 years before everybody else. They uh, switched all their students to doing an online course option to get their courses, right? So they, they taught arbitrage by how you got into classes, uh, which is, which was, uh, I'm really glad I didn't have to go through that. I wasn't a student there, I just worked there, because that sounds painful. Um, but the reason I go through all these things is not to say, hey, like this place is really cool. No, this place valued technology. They implemented technology in new and exciting ways, and they solved results from it. Uh, alumni would come back and say, I work at a Fortune 500 company, and we don't have this stuff. This is awesome. We got awards for it. We got um, noticed by industry. Like, so you would think we would value technology. We would, uh, we would value new things. And yet, this is where I worked, where they came up with everything I'm going to talk to you about here. I left Wharton and went to Adobe. Adobe being a technology company, you'd think they would value this stuff. And I know there's at least one person in the room that, that, that agrees with me that you've run into these problems at Adobe. And I now work for Google. And you'd think, like, Google, come on. <laughs> but, like, it's not the same. But, like, I don't know how many times I've been like, could you please stop using a fucking spreadsheet for something that should be in a relational database? Please, for the love of God. And so I say this not to embarrass my coworkers, not to embarrass these organizations or to step on them, but to tell you, no matter where you go, you're going to run into this problem because it's not a technology problem and it's not a, it's not a mission statement problem. It's not a culture problem. It is a <clears throat> work is done by people and people have this problem. People don't like changing. So wherever you go, I encourage you to try to change your organization instead of looking at leaving to be a solution. So along the way, I figured out some stuff. I figured out that when I was really coming up with this, I was in the midst of like learning design patterns and being very big into patterns and anti-pattern, but it fits this kind of pattern model, right? So people resist the same way over and over again. And different people resist in similar ways. You also have that people respond to certain things. So you do something and you have a certain type of resistor and they're gonna, resi they're gonna, they're gonna respond to it. And so I came up with a process. And the process is relatively simple. You identify the skeptics, you kind of, you kind of classify the, 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 uh, the people around you, which is good because you get to judge all your coworkers. We always like that. Then you match them to a countering technique. You say, all right, these people are these people. I'm going to try this on them. And then you implement the tactics, tactics in a greater strategy, which I'll outline at the end. Um, but if you look at this, this is very simple. Very simple. And that's fine. You're going to say, like, this is simple and it's common sense. You're right on both things. But don't confuse simple and easy, right? This is simple but hard, like pushing a boulder up a hill. It's simple, you apply force thusly, right? But doing it is not necessarily easy, and that's the same thing with this. It's, 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 it's a simple process, but it's not necessarily easy. So before I go forward, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to outline all this stuff, but I want to make sure one point. Because whenever I give this talk and I don't have this little caveat here, I get like a question afterwards. It's just like, well, but how do you know, like, I want to do NoSQL in a place that does SQL, and how do I know that's like the right thing? And that's, that's a very valid question. There are entire talks and entire events and entire like, you know, industries built around that question. And it's not really my place to tell you that what you're doing is right or wrong. Like, I can't, I, you know, I, I don't know, right? Because every, everything is kind of situational. So I'm going to assume you've done the work. Like I said in the beginning, we're not just implementing shiny technology. We're doing something that makes sense for us. I assume you've done that and that your, your intentions are good and you're doing the right thing. So that out of the way, like, this is meta on top of that. Like, it might be the right thing. It might be the wrong thing. That's for you to figure out. This will help you if you're doing the right thing. And I'll be doing the wrong thing too, but please, you know, use this for good, not for evil. All right, so let's talk about skeptics. It's important to note that these skeptic types are caricatures, right? These are not real, like, these are exaggerations of real people. You may see yourself reflected in some of these, and that's okay. I will point out there's one or two that I tend to be, and I will talk about that. 
It's okay if you see yourself, I'm not making fun of you, I'm putting a candy coating and exaggerating it. Okay, so yep, these are caricatures. Obviously more people are more complex. Right? So the first type is the uninformed. These guys are great, they're easy, right? Have you heard about, uh, have you heard about Chef? No. Well, let me talk to you about Chef. Uninformed, right? Pretty easy to, to change them, right? You just talk to them about the technology choice that they're making. I'll do a puppet shout out later. It's okay. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm not, I'm just, I know. It's all right. Um, so you just, uh, you just inform them and you change them. Now the danger is that you'll change them into another one of the types and that's something to be aware of. But uh, for the most part, you inform them and you guide them to learning about the new technology. You got a better chance of bringing them over to convert it. Next is the herd. Um, you guys are all here at the last event of, of the last session of a DevOps focused, uh, you know, tech event. You don't understand these people, right? You clearly don't, right? Because you're, you're, you're doing more stuff, you're trying to advance yourself, you're trying to make yourself uh, to know more, but there are a lot, a lot of work gets done by the people that show up, do the job, go home, and they're not interested in learning more stuff. And so there's a large group of people who, like they're not leading change, they're not leading technology, they are just, hey, this is what I do, I do it, I come in, I go home, leave. So you bring up a new tool or technology and they're like, maybe they've heard of it, maybe they haven't, but they're like, they're not gonna push it. But they're also not necessarily gonna fight you too hard on it, right? You just say, this is what we all should be doing, and they're like, okay, we'll get behind it. So the good news is they're relatively easy to change, the bad news is that you have to do the work of leading them, you can't just kind of like, Go do this and then walk away. They need to be led. It's fine. Next group is the cynic. Um, now, the cynic has a very important role. Uh, devil's advocate is incredibly important. It's incredibly important to ask the questions, is this the right thing? Um, is, is what we're doing here, is this the right road for us to go down? But in, and in some cases, that's exactly what the cynic is doing and more power to them and they're great. But we work in a cerebral field, and it's really important, it's a lot of currency to, to, to be thought of as smart in this field. And there's two ways, uh, basically you need to be seen as smart. There's two ways of being seen as smart. First way is by practicing and studying and playing with it and getting expertise and breaking it, figuring out why it broke and then get like a really great operational knowledge of what you're talking about, and then get up in front of a bunch of people and talk about it. And then the second way is when that person gets up and talks about it, whether it's in a meeting or on a stage or whatever, to make them look stupid. <laughs> that way it's a lot easier. Uh, also, this is the type I was guilty of, is why I have so much knowledge of the way they work. Uh, when I was younger, now I'm, I'm, I never do this. Um, but uh, but <clears throat> so it, to, sometimes it's honest cynicism, sometimes it's just knee jerk. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna be contrary because I can w make some hay out of it. So you gotta be careful of what these guys are doing. Um, but again, a lot of times they have legitimate concerns. Next is the burn. Now the burned are sort of like the cynic in that they're saying like, I don't think we should be doing this thing. But they have like experience, right? They, uh, they tried Puppet, it blew up in their face. Um, and hold on, hold on, I'm getting there, don't worry. And <laughs> it probably, since there are millions of people that are using it, it probably was them, right? But uh, you can't say uh, like, oh, well, I, I noticed that you colossally screwed this up, uh, so we're just gonna ignore what you, you had to say, right? You can't do that, you have to, you have to bring them, and, and a lot of times they'll not just get burned on a product, but like on the whole thing. Like, I know someone who didn't do virgin control because one time uh, CVS caused them major problems and like that was it, right? They're like, you know, or, or what was the other one? The micro, like the, way back when, uh, source safe, right? Source safe caused them a problem. Source safe caused you a problem, it, it wasn't probably source safe. It, it probably wasn't, it wasn't version control. It probably was source safe. Yeah, right, that's what, that's what I did. I already, I already kind of walked the line with the puppet thing and I didn't want to say it again. Um, but right, so, so these people have legitimate feedback that something, they tried to do this, and what's great is that you know where they went wrong or you can study where they went wrong and, and help not make those mistakes again, but they, they have a legitimate beef with the technology. Next is the time crunched. You know these guys? Uh, they, uh, there's never time to do it right. There's always time to do it wrong twice, right? Uh, and you know these guys, because and you know these guys are really busy, 
because you will, they will schedule meetings with you and talk to you at length over and over again about how busy they are. Um, so they have a real problem, that is their processor is pegged, right? They are just, they are thrashing and they are, uh, they are, they are like just barely treading water or, or slowly sinking. So you say, I want to do this new thing, and they're, all they're hearing is like, you want me to stop what I'm doing to like take a break when I'm already like almost drowning to do this new thing that I don't think will actually help me. Um, and so they get into panic mode and they're just not going to come along. So you can, you can get these people along if you can convince them ultimately that one, you'll save them time, and two, over the course of some period of time, you'll actually be ahead. Um, but again, that's a little bit of a challenge. The last is the boss. Um, now, I don't necessarily mean your boss. Your boss could be lovely, and you could have a great relationship with them, and it's all fantastic. What I mean by the boss here is anyone who's making a decision who's not like technically uh, part of the solution, right? So it could be someone who's making a decision to cut the check, someone who's a uh, consulting customer, whatever. Um, it's not necessarily your direct manager. And these people aren't necessarily hostile to change, or hostile to technical change. But a lot of times we talk about our technologies as solution to our problems and not necessarily solutions to their problems, right? Like, I wanted to implement a new coding, uh, a new coding uh, standard that will, you know, it'll, you know, like all of our code will look like this and it'll be great. Like, well, great. Like, this guy doesn't care, right? Like, go. Is it going to cost you time and money? Yeah, then I don't know. If, however, you can point out that, hey, you know, we're having a real trouble bringing people on board. If we had a clear coding standard, it would make people much more effective quicker, and therefore, new people would on-ramp and save you money in the long run because you're, 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 they're getting productive faster. Oh, hey, like, that's a, pro that's, a good, that, that's a solution to my problem. So again, you have to take your problem, or take your technology, or your technique, or whatever it is, and package it as a solution to their problems. So up until now, I've been talking about people that are mostly have reasonable, rational arguments. The cynic may be disagreeing with you, but they've got a point. Same thing with the burn, same thing with the boss. There is another group of people who I call the irrational, and they are not, they are not opposed to you for what I call rational reasons. You, on your first day at work, you said, what does this do? And caused like two hours of outage, right? That guy, the person whose who's, uh, Cheerios you uh, messed up, uh, now hates you forever. And like you have an idea, you are garbage, right? Not you, like, that they're saying that to me. Who's in, yeah, all right. So um, they're, they're that, it could be, you know, uh, it could be racism, could be sexism, could be uh, someone's got a job, like they, they're like, they have the, uh, if they get hit by a bus problem, like the company is screwed, and they're like, that's a good thing, right? Because now I have job security. Um, could be any one of those things. And the, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter which of the reasons is. I mean, you know, with racism, sexism, it may eventually matter from an HR perspective, but for your purposes of like pushing things forward, it doesn't matter because they're exactly the same as any of the other people that are responding this way. Just ignore them. Like, you, you, any time you spend, uh, working on them is time you could be spending doing other things. The problem is that they know they can't say, like, I'm a big old racist, right? They can't, they can't say that and get away with it. So what they're going to do is hide as another type, right? They're going to hide as, like, a uh, time crunch. They're going to hide as a burn, right? And so you've got you to figure out. And the, the big trick to these, you know, once you identify them once, it tends to be what they're doing over and over again. So you have to expend a little bit of energy finding them. And what you do is you have the argument with them. And if they stick, right, they could just be a very stubborn person. But if they flip to another one of the types, and the type they flip to is never consistent, um, that's a good indication, right? Like you, you, you defeat their burned arguments, and then they become time crunched all of a sudden. Or you defeat their cynical arguments, and they somehow like become the herd. Like well, I don't know. Like I don't care if it happens. Right. Like those sorts of changes of of personality tend to indicate that you're dealing with someone who's irrational. All right. So we got through. Here's all the people. We stereotyped all the people. Um, we had fun judging our coworkers. Now, how do we deal with them? Tactics. So there are two types of tactics. There are the universal. They can always be used. Right. You can. There's nothing blocking you from picking up this particular tool and using it. Um, there's nothing, you can always do it. Like, you can always become more of an expert in a topic, for example. But then there's situational. 
Um, they're only going to be useful if your environment lends itself to this. So like, for example, one of them is uh, compromise. You have, a, uh, you have a thing that everybody hates, a rule that everybody hates. And you say, well, if you go to this thing that I'm pushing, I'll get rid of this rule. And so you compromise and get rid of them. Um, and that's something. It only really works, though, if you have that thing. However, when you do have these things, it's highly impactful. So, so first off, we'll start with the, um, the universal. So expertise. You can always become more of an expert. One of the big problems that causes people to jump off of, like, stop learning a new technology is that they've reached the, <clears throat> I have questions, but I cannot phrase them properly uh, into a Google search box. Right? And what I mean by that is, like, take, um, I uh, recently, w since joining Google, I've had to learn Go because Google. Um, and uh, Go is different than other languages. Uh, and I was trying to come up with, like, you know, well, how do I do this construct that doesn't exist in Go and Go? And what I nearly, really had to do was explain to someone who knew Go, like, well, I want I, I to, uh, you know, I, I want to attach a whole bunch of code to the same, like, a whole bunch of functions to the same item. And, and like, eventually, like, oh, yeah, we don't do objects. You want, you want, you want is like a, 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 a custom type and explain to me how to put it together. Um, but I couldn't, I couldn't phrase that into Google. But having an expert around, it made it really easy for me to get to that answer, to get to the point where I can answer my own questions. So being an expert, again, you don't necessarily have to be fully expert. You need to be able to guide people to where they can find their answers when they start running up against these problems. Next is delivery, and I know this sort of is very common sense, but <clears throat> if everybody did it, it wouldn't have to say it, right? Don't be a jerk, right? When you're going to deliver, like you're going to try, you know, like someone has a problem, don't say like, oh, well, yeah, obviously you have a problem, you should have done this, right? Like that tends to drive people away when you could say, oh, that was an interesting choice you made. Could you explain sort of the reason, reason behind doing it that way? And then starting a conversation from there to sort of guide them into doing the thing you, you're suggesting that they do. Um, have you tried is such a more powerful uh, effector than you should do, right? It's just, it's one of those things, like it seems like, well, but I'm right, right? Like my technology is better, why do I have to sugarcoat it? Because people have like the squishy feelings and stuff and you have to be aware of that and you have to, you have to work around that. So next is demonstrate, um, show, don't tell. Uh, show someone at working. I can talk, like, I give technical demos for a living, right? I work for Google and I go out and, like, show, here, there's cool cloud stuff. Um, I can talk to people until I'm blue in the face, but I have to show, like, watch what happens when you send, you know, 10 million requests at this thing. Look at how it handles it. Um, because people don't get it unless they see it actually in action. I was pushing, uh, this is years ago, I was pushing a framework. Uh, and not getting any traction with it. So one, one day I had, one Friday I had a like Friday 4.30 conversation with my boss. He said, you know what would be great if we had this. So Monday morning we had this because I used the framework to do it. And even though I had told him about the framework multiple times, then he was really curious about it because he saw that it could be very fast and productive. So demonstrate it. Show, don't tell. The last of the situational, or the, sorry, the universal ones is trust. You have an ongoing relationship with people. Don't burn that relationship. If you lie, it'll come back to you. If you, if you um, not lie, but sort of omit things intentionally, it'll come back to you. So don't use, uh, one of my favorite things is don't use FUD. Is it, people here know what FUD is, right? Use a DevOps crowd, F fear, uncertainty, data, and doubt. Kind of coined or per perfected by IBM, depending on who you're talking to. Um, and the, the, the great example of this is like, you know, IBM people back in the 70s would take you out to dinner and be like, well, you know, it's okay, I know, I understand you're just thinking about going with somebody else, but no one ever got fired for choosing IBM. Um, and uh, you're just kind of placing that idea into their head that, like, like, they should be uncertain of what they're doing because IBM is a certain thing. Like, don't do that kind of stuff. Uh, just don't. Um, you have an ongoing relationship. Funny little side note, my dad worked for IBM, and I have this in my book about driving technical change. I have about FUD. And he got there, he, he read it, and he was like, uh, how did you know about that? I was like, Dad, it's like, it's 2010. Like, the internet is pretty full of this sort of thing. It, I think there's a Wikipedia article on it, and it specifically calls out IBM. And he's like, yeah, yeah, we totally used to do that. And he got, like, wistful. It was really weird, right? It was like, 
dad. Like, that's not a good thing. But I guess he was more sales than, uh, than engineering. All right, so on to the next things. I'll stop sharing painful family memories. Um, next thing is compromise. I talked about a little bit of that. We had a stored procedure rule. Um, people hated it. Uh, we wanted to, to move an ORM. People hated that. People hated ORM less than they hated the stored procedure rule. So we said, hey, if you use the ORM, we get rid of the stored procedure rule. Everybody moved to ORM. Um, it's a compromise, right? But you, if you have them, take advantage of them. Synergy. Um, you got some regulation, like we now have to track every change to data, uh, where it's made, where the IP address was, like law has come down and say we have to do this. Um, so you say, hey, I've got this solution, this logging solution that'll do that for us. I've been trying to push it anyway. Um, I'll tie it to this and we'll solve two problems at once. So synergy. Pressure. Anybody here work with lawyers Techno from a technology standpoint? Yeah. Yes. So why do all lawyers use WordPerfect? Because other lawyers use WordPerfect. It's the only reason, like they, they just, they all do. <laughs> and we call this network externalities or whatever you want to call it, it's electronic peer pressure. Um, you have a team that you're trying to transi transition from SVN to Git, right? The more people you move on to Git, the more help there is for Git, the more organizational information there is for it, the less the people that are doing Git, SVN to Git are comfortable and eventually they're like, screw it, I'll move over, it'll just be easier. So peer pressure. Next is bridging. Um, you want to get to a perfect place, you can't get there directly, so you go halfway, right? The sort of procedure rule I talked about before um, was, was causing a lot of struggles to get any sort of framework in, so I wrote a framework that used stored procedures, right? Like, it, <clears throat> people could move to it without necessarily going the whole way and having the whole problem. I think the last one of these is publicity, and this used to be a lot harder. Right? This is before, before like, you could just say, I'll put my stuff on GitHub and see if anybody likes it. Um, but you can get public attention if your company allows it. Make sure you've checked with all the bosses that you can share your open source code. Uh, working for Google, that is, a, that is a thing I have to do on a regular, frequent basis. Um, but uh, see if you can. If you can, it's great. If you have people using it outside of your organization, but people not using it internally, people are going to start asking questions like, why, why aren't we doing the other part of this, though, is internal. You get as much attention for it internally as you possibly can. You talk about other people's successes to random people higher up when you run to them. And then when those successes start to get investigated, the thing that you're trying to push is part of that story. And so you gain more publicity for it. All right. So those are a whole bunch of tactics. It was a very, like, 30,000-foot view. What do we do? How do we do this whole thing? How do we bring it together? So first, as I said before, ignore the hostile. Right? Any effort you put into them other than discovering that they're hostile uh, or irrational sort of is wasted energy. So you ignore them. You target the willing. And I like to think of them this way. Right? You have the uninformed and herd are really easy. You identify those people, you go after them, bring them on board. Then you go after the cynic and burned because um, they're a little bit more time intensive. They tend, there tend to be less of them. Um, and uh, you can focus more on them. Finally, you go after the time crunched. And then if you have to, as I'll go to another slide, you go after the boss. And then, really quick, easy, right? All right, two, no. Uh, this is all online, so if you, if you, you do <laughs> you want to capture this information, you don't, have to, you don't have to memorize it. But certain things work better on different people, right? So trust helps with the burned, also helps with the irrational, because they can't say you're lying because you're always being trustworthy. Um, but uh, you know, not a lot of other things help with the irrational. Um, expertise helps with the uninformed of the herd, but it's not really going to help with time crunched or boss. It doesn't matter how much you say to a time crunched, I really know this stuff, they don't care. Um, so you kind of apply things as they make sense. And then you harness and convert it, right? You get things like pressure and other parts of it. You all are telling the same story. You're all kind of, uh, kind of trying to convince other people. You kind of, and let them know that's what you're trying to do. You're, you're, you're working a camp campaign here. So you get all them working with you, and then maybe you convert everybody over. That's great. You're done. Maybe you don't. Maybe they're irrational. They just won't come over. Maybe there's just a group that won't. So then you go after and convince management and get a mandate. I'd love to tell you like the perfect story where like you never have to get your boss to like make a mandate for some of this stuff to happen. But you do sometimes, and just do it last, right? Make sure you have, like, I have a whole bunch of proof this works. A whole bunch of people are on board with it. We just need to get the other people over. Can you make this a mandate and get them on board? most of the time. So conclusions, now what? 
So it's important to note the change takes time. I sold frameworks uh, at the Wharton School 10 years ago. I left nine years ago at this point. Two years later, I go back, and this shop that wouldn't do frameworks ever were, were the problem they had now, there are too many frameworks, and they were arguing over which one was the right one to use. They were trying to come up with a, a, uh, a key, uh, like a master one. Uh, it took time, though, right? It was like the five years I spent doing it, and then I left, for two, uh, I was gone, and someone more capable than me came in and, and closed the deal and got him over and took two years. Change takes time, and you're not, you know, so take the little victories as they come, um, go with them. It also takes politics. People hate office politics, right? Like, I, I hate, you know, like, why can't, I'm just right. Why do I have to, why do I have to, like, do a campaign? It's because people are people. So here's what I say. If you really don't like office politics, I can tell you the easiest way to make it so that office politics will never bother you again. So you start out with office politics, and you don't, you don't acknowledge it exists, and then you get burned by it and say, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll play the game. I'll do a little bit. And so you talk to this person and help them get on board. And, you know, you, you do all the things, right? And then, like, you find that it works. So the next time you do it again, it becomes a little easier. Do it again, it comes a little easier. And then at the end of it, once you master it, you're not doing anything. You're not like, uh, I'm going to carefully go out and do a campaign. You're, you're just like, you know, like, all right, I'm going to talk to this person. I want to be successful. I do, I do these things. And then office politics doesn't exist for you. It's like a whole Zen circle of life, right? You've gone from, it, I, I don't believe it exists to, it doesn't exist because it doesn't, I just, I just do it. Um, but you're asking people to do new things. And even if this is, makes you uncomfortable, you have to do new things, right? You, you, have, to, you have to change. Uh, yourself in order to encourage other people to change. And the last thing I'll leave you with is that between where you are and where you want to be, there are a lot of better places. A lot of people give up hope because they can't get to that magic one button deploy where code, you know, press the button, it moves the code, code reviews happen, they come back in, it gets pushed through unit testing, gets all tested, drives out, and boom, it's in production You know, five minutes later. Um, a lot of people don't think they can get there, and so they say, why bother? And the, the reason why is because, one, there are companies that get there. And this room probably has tons of stories of companies that have gotten there. But even if you haven't gotten there, any part of that is better than not doing it at all. And the fact of the matter is, is that even if you do it all and you get there, by the time you get there, it'll be time to do version 2.0 of whatever. Or it'll be, now we're doing something completely different. Now we're not doing, uh, you know, we're, we're not doing cloud anymore. Everybody builds all their stuff on on physical racks of Raspberry Pis, right? Like, <laughs> whatever it is, um, change is going to happen. And so change in technology is not a destination, right? It is a journey. It's always going to be a journey. So make sure you know that, hey, you know what? Different, further along is better than just standing still. With that, I'll say, I'll open up the questions if I have time. But I have a book, I have a plug book. Uh, if you want to learn more, um, it's available via pragprog.com or Amazon. And again, if you want to bug me with anything, my Twitter is TP Ryan. I usually respond to questions, comments, or snarky remarks there. Um, and with that, I'll say thank you. Um, you uh, lumped into the irrational category uh, a class of person that I am dealing with where their leadership position is based upon technical accomplishments over the past decade. And the change you're trying to get done involves moving away from key aspects of that. And so you're rendering their work and their merit irrelevant if the change actually occurred. And so you get this fear response from people who aren't in a position where they're going to go and start a new 10-year journey because they're a senior vice president or a director or a principal partner type thing. Any advice? Yeah. Uh, try not to end up there, right? Um, <laughs> No, it, that, is, that is a definite problem, um, uh, especially as people get you know, Peter principled or just like, oh, you can deal with people, uh, so we'll make you engineering manager, or we'll make you, like that happens all the time. It is a difficult thing, and what I would say, it's really tough when the irrational and, and the boss that you have to convince are the same, right? That makes it very, very hard. And what I would say is, one, see if there are ways to go around or above, because they have a boss too. Um, now, that might be, if they're the CIO or they're the CEO, you're kind of SOL. Um, but uh, you can't go above them in those cases. Or see if, one, you can convince them that tiny parts of it um, and, and see if you can share the glory with them, right? It sucks because it's your, your baby and you're making it. But see if you can't 
make it sound like to them that it's their idea. And that's, that's a very tough rhetorical uh, thing to do. But again, if you get enough of your coworkers having success with this um, in small um, test projects and whatnot, it becomes pretty hard to ignore. And I think there you sort of, again, delivery helps a lot um, and uh, demonstration. Um, those, are the, those are the ways I'd go after that. Um, but I, I don't discount, here's where I fall back on, I said simple, not easy, right? Like, it, you, you will have to do a lot of work with them. I guess the thing, is, there's also another personality type, the hero, the person that wants to come in and swoop and fix it all. And it's a problem because a lot of businesses will sort of reward that behavior, you know, oh, this was the superstar who saved our butts on this day, and so they get a trip to Hawaii and things like that. How do you deal with um, that sort of entrenched behavior? Well, what I would say is that uh, that's a great question. Um, so one, there's no reason why you can't uh, kind of fool them into thinking it's their idea. So you can harness their ability to, to, to jump into that sort of thinking and help them close the deal. You have to share a little bit of the glory, a little bit of the credit, but you, you can do that. The other thing, though, is that I would argue that that is actually just still irrational because it's not a technical reason, right? Someone says no sequel is bad because, uh, be, because um, I don't know, someone, someone says relational databases are bad because it can't scale. Like, that is a technical point that you can fight, right? Um, the idea that they're high, because they can't say like, oh, no, I'm not going to help you out because I'm going to wait till the last second, swoop in and save the day and get that trip to Hawaii. Like, that's an irrational thing. So I would treat them like any other irrational. But see if you can't, you know, harness that uh, because you know what they're doing. Um, but yeah, they're, they're irrational. All right. One more Thank round of applause much. for Terry. I hunt bullies and brutes hunting for you.